The oceans cover over 70% of the Earth. This is the 180th meridian. If you take a look at it from orbit, you will see almost no land. It seems that the whole hemisphere is a giant ocean. Yet our planet is called Earth, not water. It has been known since the earliest times that there is solid ground underwater. The ocean bottom, and even deeper underneath. There is something that people have long been extracting on shore. Precious stones, metals, raw chemicals, hydrocarbons. Naturally abundant, all this lies there, beneath the ocean bed. This means that as soon as onshore mineral resources are depleted, people will have to, well, get their feet wet, dive deep into shelf waters. Engineers call it open underwater mining of shelf deposits. At first, of course, this was possible only in shallow water, but with each new decade, people are going deeper and deeper and deeper. This process is firmly underway. Our country extracts oil on the shelf of the Pechora Sea. This Arctic oil is the northernmost in the world. Hydrocarbons are sourced from the Baltic and Caspian Seas. And finally, several offshore platforms operate near Sakhalin. Lunskoya A, the first stationary gas platform in Russia. And oil platforms, Piltun Ostovskaya A and Piltun Ostovskaya B. 24 7, day and night in summer and winter. Work is conducted, pushing the limits of science and technology. Oil and gas are extracted to the surface and transported to the mainland for processing and further use. That is how the seabed gets developed. By extracting power from the water's depths. Offshore platforms like Lunskoya A, or Loon A for short, are more often reached by air rather than by sea. Incidentally, you will simply not be admitted on board a helicopter unless you first complete specialized helicopter underwater escape training. After all, takeoff and landing are considered quite dangerous. The platform itself is a full-fledged mini-city. Even after a week, you still lose your way around these tangled corridors, stairs, levels, and rooms. However, this colossus may be generally divided into two large areas, production and accommodation. The first area has everything for hydrocarbon production 
and platform operation. The second offers everything for comfortable living. Cabins, leisure, meals, fast internet. It seems that you are in a hotel on the mainland rather than on a reinforced concrete tech island in the open sea. On a sunny day, it seems like a stone's throw from the shore, but this feeling is misleading. In fact, it's 14 kilometers to the Sakhalin shore, and the distance from the highest platform point to the seabed is 152 meters, higher than the Great Pyramid, higher than Europe's tallest Ferris wheel, and just a bit shorter than the famous Shukhov Tower in Moscow. Particular interest is stirred by the platform supports, or in scientific terms, gravity-based structures. These are gigantic structures resting on the seabed, designed to withstand both the weight of the platform and the pressure of pack ice in winter, and even potential seismic loads. Moreover, each support is also a structure with internal spaces and communications. For example, the first support has seawater pumps. They desalinate water for further use on the platform. The third support has the main export pipelines for transporting gas to Sakhalin. The fourth one has embedded sewage system caissons. And the second support has wells for hydrocarbon production. In total, there are one, two, three, in some 24 wells, each with a depth between 2,000 and 3,000 meters. The Lunskaya field, just like all the others, by the way, is not a single large cavity like a cave, but an area of scattered, finely porous rocks like sandstone. Thus, wells are drilled down and in different directions to maximize the gas extraction area. And the distances are enormous. Some wells extend their reach as far as nine kilometers away from the Lunskoye A platform. But how are multiple holes made in the ground if the platform itself is stationary? The answer is obvious. The drilling rig is mobile. This means it can move left, right, forwards, and back. If we take a look at this whole thing from above, we can see that it moves inside a rectangle. And if we put this rectangle in a circle, we will get a cross-section of one of the gravity supports of the platform. Drilling is ultimately a high-tech process. It is fully or almost fully automated. Mechanisms are operated from a protected operator's cabin. But the production of hydrocarbons is not just about drilling. Gas conditioning for future transportation to the mainland is no small task either. We are so used to pure gas at home that we have no idea what it looks like underground. Down there, it's a heck of a mix of methane, sand, produced water, and various impurities like condensate. Directing such natural gas to the main export pipelines is strictly forbidden. Pipelines can be damaged quickly if nothing is done, for example, with produced water in gas. Here is why. Gas flow in the pipelines is accompanied by the temperature fluctuating up and down. The pressure also fluctuates up and down. As a result, water vapor condenses into almost snowflakes that stick to the inner pipe walls in turn. 
Well, not into snowdrifts, though it looks similar, but into gas hydrate plugs, which clog the pipe tightly. One such clog means a full stop for gas production and transportation. Now then, in order to prevent this, natural gas is conditioned here on the platform. For example, by adding monoethylene glycol. A substance well known to drivers, monoethylene glycol or ethylene glycol is an antifreeze agent. It is part of windscreen washer fluids and brake fluids so that the fluids don't freeze in the cold. It's the same here. Ethylene glycol prevents water, which remains in natural gas, from freezing. Scientifically, it prevents gas hydrates in the pipeline. Monoethylene glycol is added here, and after that, we can say that's it. The natural gas is ready to leave the platform. It leaves through one of the platform's supports. Through two pipes on the bottom of the Sea of Okhotsk, having reached Sakhalin, the gas is subject to multi-step drying and separation processes. All of them take place at the Onshore Processing Facility, abbreviated as OPF. Here they are, the two pipes from Lune platform. By the way, the distance from here to the coast of the Sea of Okhotsk is 6 kilometers and 46 kilometers to the nearest inhabited area. The region here is extremely wild and deserted. A common question asked here is, have you seen bears on the way? What the? Bears, as well as foxes, hares. The entire fauna of Sakhalin, including the unusual Siberian musk deer, can all be found in the local forests. Built in such a place in just four years, the facility is a perfect example that the sky is the limit for people. Here's why. Nowadays, we can see what is practically a city, but initially there was just ordinary Sakhalin terrain here. Rather flat, hilly plain with abundant rivers, streams, and swamps, and of course no infrastructure at all. Not even any dirt roads, tap water, heating, or housing. Nothing at all. How can we visualize the tremendous human input in this facility? Quite simply, we just have to look at what was then and what is now. So, what is the purpose of the OPF? We remember that gas and oil leave platforms and reach the mainland almost unchanged. For example, gas from the Lunskoya A contains ethylene glycol, produced water and condensate, and a blend of liquid hydrocarbons, while crude oil from the northern offshore platforms has associated gas. Now, this whole mix must be separated. The verb comes from the Latin word separatio. Here is the first separator. It is called a three-phaser here, because it divides natural gas into three components. Methane, condensate, and water with ethylene glycol. Well, simply put, gas is separated from liquid. Yet nothing is dumped or discarded. The OPF is eco-friendly and interconnected with all facilities in the chain of production, conditioning, and transportation of hydrocarbon. It even generates electricity on its own by burning natural gas produced on the platform. But that's not all. The energy from these gas turbines is enough to operate the entire facility and the offshore platform as well. 
From here, electricity flows back along an underground cable to Lunskoya A. This is an operations diagram of the whole OPF complex. Ethylene glycol is dewatered and directed back to the Loon A platform for reuse. Condensate extracted from natural gas is blended with oil to form a single product. Purified from water, ethylene glycol and condensate treated natural gas is fed into a separate pipeline. This is how the whole system works. But there's a catch. Any gas field has reservoir pressure, in other words, underground pressure. For example, it is 110 bar in different wells for the Lunskoya field, while it can reach 115, 117, 120, even 125 bar for other ones, for now. But as gas is produced, reservoir pressure naturally decreases. And gas should be fed to the onshore facility at a pressure of at least 86 and a half bar. What do we do in this case? The answer is to build another facility, an OPFC, compression station. It will be integrated into the OPF. This is the very place where the compression station is connected to the onshore processing facility by its main pipelines. That is, currently natural gas is supplied this way, directly to the OPF. And after the commissioning of the OPF compression station, the flow will be like this, getting the necessary pressure from the compression station compressors and then returning here and then to the onshore processing facility. At the heart of the OPF compression station are powerful gas compressor units. They will compensate for the drop in Lunskoya gas pressure. Literally, as the name of the station implies, compress it. In very simple words, the purpose of the OPF and the OPF compression station can be conveyed in three words. Separate, compress, and feed. That is, separate initial crude hydrocarbons from the offshore platforms into their component elements, maintain pressure, and dispatch the products such as oil and gas with over 90% methane further along the process chain. So the story ends where it began. Let us recall, here are the gas pipes from the Loon A platform. There is an oil and gas pipeline from the northern offshore platforms of Sakhalin. This is what is fed to the OPF. And literally a few meters away, there's the outlet. A pipe with oil to which condensate was added here, and a big yellow gas pipe. Well, Godspeed! This route runs almost along the entire island. Approximately in the middle, the Trans-Sakhalin pipeline system passes through the booster station. Its purpose is similar to that of the OPF compression station, to maintain gas pressure up to the final destination, the Prigorodnaya production complex. The pipeline emerges on the surface in the south of Sakhalin Island, and here natural gas is subject to an incredibly unusual transformation. This complex was built on the coast of a bay with a melodious name, Aniva. Whether you like it or not, rhythm is in the air. The scenery is truly stunning. The bay is free of ice in winter, and therefore this is the perfect place for year-round oil and gas shipments. Oil is at first fed into these tanks, and then pumped onto sea tankers.
yet methane will have to pass two more tests before shipment. Pressure and temperature test. Methane changes its physical state here. In brief, at the plant inlet, it is still in its usual gaseous state. While at the outlet, it takes on a very unusual and very cold liquid form, LNG in scientific terms. The fact is that natural gas in its liquid state takes up about 1 600th the volume. Admittedly, it must be cooled down for this to a significant extent, down to minus 165 degrees. Naturally, there are no such temperatures on Earth. The lowest value ever recorded was in Antarctica in 2010, minus 98 degrees. Climatologists say it might drop to minus 100 in deeper areas. However, that is not enough to liquefy gas. But people are able to overcome nature's barriers with technology. Day and night, this plant does what the climate of our planet is unable to do. It cools methane down to a cryogenic temperature at an industrial scale, making it liquid and thereby reducing its volume. The plant has a borderline. It is not demarcated in any way, but experts know that here, gas is still in its usual, if I may say so, dry state. From here, it gradually converts into liquid. A logical question is, why do we need all this? Colossal energy input, formidable technology, enormous volumes of liquefied gas. Why? The answer is simple. Logistics and economy. The more hydrocarbons one vessel can carry, the cheaper it is to transport. Methane gas compressed to 1 600th its original volume is very lucrative for shipping. This trick will not work with oil. It's almost impossible to reduce its volume by compression. Probably, a non-expert might have a seemingly logical question. Where is the very place where gas turns into a liquid? The answer is so short that it may surprise everyone. There is no such place. The whole process is stepwise. First, air cooling with fans. The temperature of the methane falls. Then it is passed through the cooling units step by step. The temperature of the methane falls. More and more. And stop. Now comes the tricky part. If the coolant cools the methane, what cools the coolant? The most common way to achieve low temperatures is the same. For large cryogenic plants, and let's say for your refrigerator or air conditioner. This is when gas is compressed and passes through a flow resistor in the pipeline. A choke. In other words, through a narrow hole. After passing through the choke, the gas expands quickly and its temperature decreases. Thus, methane is cooled down step by step to the target, minus 165 degrees, becoming a liquid, shrinking in volume, fed to the tanks for storage. These are, in fact, giant thermoses. As the poet Yasinin said, we should step back 
for better observation. Well, of course, this sounds nice, but in order to perceive the true size of these structures, you need to climb them. And then you feel how colossal they are when you are walking, just like this, on the top of a 100,000 cubic meter tank. Yes, this is certainly a tremendous thing. Afterwards, the liquefied natural gas just sits and literally waits on the weather until it is time for the final step. This 805-meter jetty is sometimes called the last link in the LNG chain. Well, it is more like an arterial road with a very unusual vessel at the end, one that carries gas a gas carrier. Gas carriers arrive at the pre gorodnoye production complex on average 15 times per month. And here is a question. What are these huge white spheres on the gas carrier? Well, it's clear they contain liquefied gas. Why are they shaped so? In fact, it is simple. A sphere is an efficient volumetric shape. Moreover, during sea shipment, the methane remains in a liquid that is supercooled state. So each gas carrier tank has powerful heat insulation. Right angles could reduce their effectiveness. Though, to tell the truth, there are different types of gas carriers. For example, some have tanks integrated into the enclosure. These are called membrane tanks. They also carry LNG to the pre gorodnaya production complex. And now, the final question. Why such a large effort? Such a lengthy route for carbohydrates? Through thick ground and deep water up to the platform. Along pipelines to the coast of Sakhalin. Extremely complex drying and separation processes transportation throughout the entire island, and a no less labor-intensive cooling and liquefying process. What for? Essentially, all this is for energy liberation. For millions of years, it has been accumulated underwater and underground. And now, on board one of the many special tankers and gas carriers, it can be transported to, well, almost anywhere. The oceans cover over 70% of the Earth. But if water used to be a barrier to hydrocarbon extraction, now it facilitates hydrocarbon transportation to people all over the world for warmth and comfort.